The fourth and last block. So while you're sitting down, uh, how many of you actually use M plus? Oh boy. All right. So um, how many of you will be here tomorrow? Good. That's good. That's good. Tomorrow will be a good um, piece of background for what coming, what's coming next in this series of eight topics. So structural equation modeling, we've already done it. We did it this morning, and we've done it this afternoon, uh, particularly when we uh, have talked about uh, analysis with covariates. Uh, what is it? Well, multiple outcomes, certainly involving latent variables, testing direct and indirect effects. This is on slide 224. In a system of regression equations for latent variables without the influence of measurement error. You know, it's really a combination of uh, confirmatory factor analysis and simultaneous equation systems from econometrics. So psychometrics and econometrics combined uh, a la Euroscope's invention uh, in uh, LISRO. Uh, the, uh, much of the machinery is the same as for CFA. And there are certainly a, there's certainly a great need for establishing a series of careful steps in the SEM, the CFA model. Latent variables are involved, and establish the model of the relationship among both the observed and latent variables. And we want to advocate building up models very carefully in these small s steps that are possible for. Um, you can always break down a very complex model into small model fitting steps, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that with the help of a um, classic picture from. Uh, uh, 1987 book chapter in um, sociological methodology, the Wheaton et al. study. I'm one of the et al.s. <laughs> it's a long story to that, but um, uh, this has then made its way, this example, into uh, many uh, users' guides for different programs. And what you have is several measures of uh, indicators of alienation in 1967 and in 1971. Uh, here, uh, we're left with only two indicators, anomia and powerlessness, measured in 67 and measured again in 71. And you have um, the interest in studying the stability of alienation, or the lack thereof, between 67 and, eight and 71. Apparently, there was some structural change ha happening in the, uh, in the uh, town where these measurements were taken, a steel mill was either, at, either added or, or, or taken away. I can't remember now. Uh, so, and, and among sociologists, this would be called a panel study. That is, you follow the same number of individuals from 67 to 71. And panels, in panel studies among sociologists are interested in stability. Uh, this paper had two new features, if I remember correctly. One was that you introduced measurement error. Alienation was measured with indicators that had measurement error epsilon sitting up here. That was one innovation. And the other innovation was that you brought in a covariate socioeconomic status uh, that influenced alienation at both time points so that the uh, stability effect, the regression of alienation 71 and 67, is only a partial regression coefficient controlling for SES. So alienation 71 has two predictors, alienation 67S and the SES. And both of those uh, new features will affect the estimation of the stability here. So that was the idea. And this is an interesting example then of uh, 
a model that um, brings up a lot of potential problems. First of all, we note that we have only um, two indicators. I'll do this. We only have two indicators here. So uh, the model specification is very easy. You have on slide 227, SES by education, SEI. Alienation 67 is measured by 2 and 71 by 2. You see the on statements here, alienation 71 on two predictors, alienation 67 on one. And you have, in addition, some interesting with statements here. Often in longitudinal data, you have correlated errors for the same indicator across time. 67 with 71 for anomia and 67 with 71 for powerlessness. <clears throat> Here I think you have all of, or most of the key uh, keywords in the M plus modeling language by, on, and with in one single model. Very compactly written. And you get a fairly good fit, as you might expect from a uh, textbook type of example. And you get uh, significant effects here uh, in the, uh, or significant loadings rather, in the measurement models, the three measurement models, and significant effects of alienation 71 on 67. 0.607 will be the stability estimate, perhaps standardized down to 0.567, controlling for SES. As usual, you know, when we have more than one predictor, we're talking about partial regression coefficients. So the increase in alienation 71 as a function of an increase in alienation 67, holding SES constant, you know, the holding constant of other factors, the Ceteris, Ceteris parvus statement needs to be expressed as well. Uh, we get the residual variances for the indicators. And uh, what else do we have? We have R square. Uh, we have uh, R square for the observed indicators on slide 232. Reasonably high, 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, except for uh, the SEI indicator, which is the socioeconomic uh, index. I think it's a Duncan index for socioeconomic status. Has a little bit lower reliability. Now, um, this example brings up a lot of interesting uh, issues. And we talked about model building strategies, being able to break down a given complex model that you're interested in, this model here, into its subparts. One way to do that is to start a structural equation model like this with an analysis of the measurement parts. SES would be one measurement part, uh, alienation in 67 a second, alienation in 71 a third. That's what you would want to do, you know, through the series of EFA, if, you'd, if you know very little about the measurement instrument, and certainly CFA, you want to come to a point where you can test that each measurement part fits the data well. And only then put it together with a structural model that you have here between the latent variables. That's what I mean by breaking down the model into parts. So you would break it down into three parts, SES, anomia, uh, alienation 67, and alienation 71. That's what you would want to do. Do those analysis, those three analyses separately, and then add on the structural part. This example, though, really shows the um, weakness of having only two indicators, because none of those three parts can be done separately, because you only have two indicators. This part of the model is under-identified, has more parameters than pieces of sample statistics. You know, you have the factor variance, factor loading, and the two residual variances, one, two, three, four parameters, and you only have covariance plus the two variance, you only have three pieces of sample information. So you're one piece of information short to even make it just identified. <clears throat> Same for each of the other two constructs. You can't test that model separately by itself. So that's a weakness. You would want to have four, five, or more indicators to be able to test the, the appropriateness of that model. Certainly, for SES, it may be very true that you have that correlated error problem we talked about this morning between education and SEI. Maybe a measurement error that's correlated. And uh, 
since this part of the model is not, as we will call it, it's not self-sufficient, it has to rely on information uh, of covariance between those variables and the other variables in the model. Any such misspecification can spread into a misestimation mis of the structural parameters, that is, the regression parameters among the latent constructs. Just like the example this morning. The example this morning was also just identified, uh, and or was also suffering from that um, under information for the factor model. Same for the um, two alienation constructs, where you have then uh, the, the possibility, of course, to put them together. Say that if you can't break it down into two parts here, how about looking at the joint part? So you have two indicators for each of two factors that are correlated. We said that that was identified. That was one of our rules of thumb, right? Except now we have correlated errors. Correlated errors make that measurement model part not identified by itself. So once again, you cannot establish the uh, plausibility of that measurement model uh, without, having, without putting it together with other parts of the model, other parts perhaps also being misspecified. So you're trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and that's hard to do here. So really, uh, every construct should have more than uh, uh, two indicators, more than three indicators, actually four or five at least. In fact, um, these correlated errors here, they're very well motivated by uh, left out covariates that influence anomia measurements similarly at the two time points and therefore making the errors have some common component, making them correlate. It's very well motivated, but to identify that, you need to have not only the covariances among the anomia powerlessness items, but the covariance between those items and the uh, uh, SCS indicators down there. But if you had more indicators, you could use that bottom-up strategy that I talked about, break down the model into its parts, measurement parts, several of those and then test the measurement versus the structural part. Now, the structural part here says nothing, uh, imposes no further restriction. You know, it's like having three factors that are correlated, except that you just parameterize it as a regressions. But you have the same number of parameters here for these three factors as you would if you just said that they were correlated. So there are no left out arrows here, no left out arrows. So there's no further uh, restriction imposed here. In fact, you could do, write this, and here's an equivalent model example. You could write this as a correlated factors model, three correlated factors, each with two indicators. It would be the same statistically. But in principle, model building strategies by breaking down the model and looking at the measurement versus structural part is a good idea. It just couldn't be done here due to the number of indicators being too few, uh, where you run into identifiability problems when you try to make the model more, more uh, realistic, like including correlated errors between the educators down here. So this model is very much not robust to this specification. It's very, very fragile, I would say. And therefore, uh, it loses out in believability. Now, believability has to do with the validity of the measures, uh, and even if the measures are very valid, what about the model fact or the uh, measurement model itself? The direction of the arrows is an issue. Uh, you have the uh, situation here where you have a factor model where alienation, your alienation status influences how you respond to the anomia and powerlessness que questionnaires. That direction of arrows going out from the factor is motivated. But is it motivated for SES? Do you have an SES uh, propensity within you that makes you go after an education and go after a socioeconomic status? Or is it that you, have, you get an education which gives you a socioeconomic status because of the income, and those two together influence your SES status? That is, the arrows going the other way. That's called formative indicator thinking in the SEM world. And the difference is that when the formative indicators are used, 
you're no longer assuming that the uh, indicators are uncorrelated given the, late, given the latent variable. Uh, you, the, the influence, the co covariance between those indicators and the rest of the indicators of the model are still going through these factors. It's just that the covariance structure for the indicators, the formative indicators, is not the restrictive factor analytic kinds. So you have to think about that. It makes a difference. And we're going to show you some inputs for formative modeling, too. And then finally, um, you may be um, fishing in the completely wrong uh, fishbowl, or you may be in the wrong ballpark. There may be totally different models. And I guess that has to do with the equivalent models as well. That might be relevant. Uh, perhaps there are nonlinear relationships here between the variables for an interaction effect between SCS and alienation, uh, which doesn't necessarily lead itself to, mi to a misfit of this model, may not show up. A linear model like this may fit well, but still be the wrong model. You have to think about other models that might be reasonable and contrast the likelihoods of those other models with that of this model. And then final point, quality of estimates. Parameters, uh, parameter estimate quality, standard errors, and power of uh, rejecting zero effects, for instance, is very much dependent on the quality of the indicators, uh, not only the factor loading size and reliability values, but also the number of indicators. The more you have, the better the, your power. So the more indicators you have, the better the power to reject that the stability is zero here. Standard errors uh, don't get well estimated unless you have a large enough sample size. These kinds of issues can be studied by Monte Carlo studies. Monte Carlo studies simulating data according to a postulated model, uh, perhaps where the parameter values come from the substantive study, can help you in that regard. So uh, let's move on to slide 234. And say a few words about model identification. Do you recognize this picture? You, uh, your mind was still fresh, and you were, <coughs> you were still young and hopeful. And uh, model identification, identification issues can be taken lightly, guided by the computer program telling you what to do and not to do. Or uh, if you're more serious substantively, you may want to learn a little bit more about it. Here we have the example of alcohol consumptions. And let me put 235 on this slide, on this screen, rather. This is a just identified model. The number of parameters is the same as the number of variances and covariances. You can count them. And if you go to slide 237, you can actually derive very simply from the rules I gave you this morning, what the variances and covariances between all of the variables are as expressed by the model parameters. And it shows then that you can solve for the key parameter beta here. It is actually the covariance between y and x2 sitting here, which is lambda 2, lambda two beta psi 11 divided by the covariance between the two x's, which is lambda 2 psi 11, you know, the ratio of that comes out to be beta. That is showing algebraically that the model is identified. And it shows how it becomes identified. And this was a formula I used to show you the misspecification that you got when you were forced to ignore this residual correlation in slide 235, the theta 21. And that's what I have at the bottom of slide 237. So you can actually go through uh, and solve for each and every parameter here. It's a good exercise for you when you take the plane back home to sit and solve for that and, sh and, I and verify that this model is identified. We're not going to do more of it and then to give you that flavor. Formative indicators, you know, what we might have wanted to use for the SCS construct. <clears throat> Slide 239. Two, two versions of that. Uh, here, it's the formative indicators are income, occupation, and education. The uh, formative construct is F, the factor. And in model one, we have uh, friends being an observed dependent variable, which is a function of F. 
in model two, the dependent variable is a factor Fy, which is measured by indicators of Fy. So Fy is related to F. So it's a latent variable. So you have it here in model two, you have a formative measurement model on the left. And I guess it's called reflective, reflective factor analytic measurement model on the right. And what this formative model does is um, it essentially has to, you have to fix two things. You fix the residual variance of the factor to zero, <clears throat> and you fix one of the uh, slopes of the formative indicators to one, and then estimate the other two slopes. What that is really then saying that F is essentially a sum of these three items, sum of those indicators, except that you weight them differently. This weight for occupation may be different than one, as might this weight for education be. So it's a weighted sum where you estimate the relative weights. But if these variables have measurement errors in them, well, then the weights may be misspecified for the same reason that you have in the, the that you have misspecification, attenuation, and linear regression. But anyway, this can be done. And uh, you, have, you can see the specification in M plus here. It's a regression relationship. Uh, model 3 and Model 4 are equivalent models. I'll leave it to your self-study to, to figure out why they are equivalent. That is, Model 3 is equivalent with Model 1, and Model 4 is equivalent with Model 2. But that's up to you to figure out. This is the Hodge-Triman social status indicator example. Four formative indicators. And you have the M plus setup for each of those models here. Here you have the formative indicator F on income, occupation, education. First slope fixed at 1, residual variance fixed at 0. And then you get the outcome Y regressed on F, slide 241. So I won't go through that here. <clears throat> here you have model 2 on slide 243. Let's instead go to slide 246 and talk about latent variable interactions. So we have a medley of topics here, but all of them were motivated by the uh, Wheaton et al. analysis. We raised the question of whether socioeconomic status and alienation in 67 might be, uh, might be interacting with each other. Well, here is a more general model of this kind. <clears throat> Say that you have uh, factors F, a factor F4 measured by indicators y10 to 12 regressed on another factor F3. And F3 is in turn regressed on F1 and F2. Uh, but we're also regressing F3 on the interaction between F1 and F2. So the interaction between two latent variables. What do we do with the interactions in linear regression? Well, we just multiply x1 times x2, right? And include that as a third variable. You can do that through the defined statement in M plus. But if the variables are latent, you can't just multiply them because you don't have them in the data. So Andreas Klein, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> Andreas Klein and his <clears throat> advisor wrote an article in uh, Psychometrica in 2000 <clears throat> where they talked about a maximum likelihood approach to uh, allowing for these kinds of latent variable interactions. And Herb Marsh et al. has a nice discussion of these kinds of techniques in the 2004 psych methods article. So this can be done in M plus using, I guess I don't have that, it's using the uh, X with statements. So you say F3 on F1, F2, and the uh, name of the variable that you define by the so-called X with statement, X, W, I, T, H. <clears throat> So that's taken care of and could be relevant for this Wheaton et al. model to uh, get a better likelihood. Read more about it in the user's guide. We have an example of this particular kind in the user's guide. Monte Carlo simulations to try to figure out empirically what sample size you need to get good parameter estimates, good standard errors, and sufficient power. What do you do? Well, slide 249. You say that you uh, want to generate data for four y's, say, and two x's. <clears throat> and you pretend that you have 500 observations. And you want to generate 500 data sets, n reps, 500. 
<clears throat> we want to dichotomize X2. We cut it in two parts. And we want to add some missingness using the pat miss, pattern missingness and pattern probabilities statement. Uh, all of this is described in detail in the M plus user's guide in chapter 11. So you can generate data and add to that a certain missing data uh, structure to it. Then you have a populate model population statement which says which parameters govern the uh, data generation. Here we have a factor measured by four indicators, and the factor is regressed on two x's. So it is clearly a, a CFA, or a factor analysis with covariates. And then you have an analysis model. The analysis model is, in this case, also fact, the same factor model with covariates. But in principle, you don't have to have the same model. You can study misspecification and see how badly it comes out. You generate the data according to one model and estimate by another. But here we want to have the same model for both model data generation and model estimation to see how well we recover parameter estimates. And I think we want to focus on this page, slide 253. <clears throat> Here you have the factor measurement, the four indicators for the factor, and then the factor regressed on covariates. In the population column are the true values. And in the estimate average column are the average over the different data sets that you generated, which you then, of course, would want to be close to the true values. So 0.3 was the true value. The average estimate is 0 0.3029. Very nice uh, uh, result there for, for this particular sample size. This estimate could be further away from 0.3 if you cut the sample size down from 500 to say what, five to 100 or something like that. And you can also check that the standard errors are on average good. And good means that the standard deviation, standard error should be close to the standard deviation of the parameter estimates across the different replications. And finally, uh, we skip the mean square error column. 95% uh, coverage, the confidence interval should co cover the true value 95% of the time for 95% coverage. And percent significance has to do with the power in the last column. The power with which you can reject, say, that the effect of x2 on f is 0. You want to reject that the effect of x2 on f is 0. That power turns out to be 0.806. The, uh, bottom right value on slide 253.806, which is, uh, by standards, uh, power standards, a good power, sufficient power, to reject that the um, uh, x2 has no effect on f when the true value is 0.3. You might want, want to ask, well, if the true value had been 0.2, what would the power have been? Probably lower. So you could play around with these different alternatives and learn more about the recoverability of your parameter values. If you want to read more about that, um, you can look at this paper that Linda showed you uh, earlier, Mutian and Mutian 2002, in the SEM journal, which goes through uh, this in slow detail, how to do a simulation like this. But if you want to read about how to interpret the output, uh, go to chapter 11 of the user's guide. Model constraints, what is that? That's a very useful feature. Slide 255. Uh, you have a model, say a factor model here, measured by y1 through y3, uh, factor 2 by y4 through y6. And now we're going to give we're going to give labels in parentheses to all of these free parameters. And the first param first lambda is fixed at one, so it's not a free parameter. But we give uh, names, little labels here to each of the parameters. And then you can, uh, in model constraint, the model constraint command, you can define new parameters that are functions of these model parameters. So for instance, you can define the reliability rel2, the reliability for item 2, which is a function of the model parameters lambda2 squared plus the variance of the factor 1 
That's the ex explained part of the variation in, in item 2 in Y2 divided by the total variance of Y2. That's a reliability, right? It's not a parameter that we estimate in the model, but it's a parameter that's a function of parameters we estimate in the model. So rel2 is a new parameter. And by doing this model constraint, we're going to get the estimate of rel2 and the standard error for it. Particularly, the standard error is something that you will be hard pressed to get otherwise. It's actually taking place by using the delta method behind the scenes for this. And also, the standardized solution, STAN3, standardized solution, uh, if you look at the formula, it's the same that we've given. And here you would get that standardized value and the standard error. There's not a need for that now because we have standard errors for the standardized solutions. But it shows you the idea that you can create any function of model parameters that you're interested in, any old, any old function, and it's quite a quite flexible uh, scheme for putting them together. And then you also get the standard errors for that. So many people find that quite useful in specifying non-standard models. We've seen quite a lot of use for that feature. And um, yeah, I, I think I won't talk about this slide 256, but you can read more about the model constraint command in the user's guide. Instead, let's talk about model test. That's a very, very useful um, feature as well. Model test. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's a walled chi-square test. Uh, it, walled is uh, the uh, alternative to the so-called likelihood ratio chi-square test. You know, the chi-square that we looked at for all of the CFA models was a likelihood ratio chi-square test. It's a test of your model, H0, against the totally unrestricted H1. The walled is also a test of two competing uh, models, but not based on li the likelihood, not based on maximum likelihood, but based on a, uh, a chi-square procedure, which is more akin to the Pearson chi-square that you have for a contingency table. And what you do is you test restrictions on the parameters, not restrictions that are imposed, restrictions not imposed by the model. Now, you know, model constraint had restrictions imposed by the model, could, could impose restrictions added to the model. A model test does not uh, concern restrictions imposed by the model, but restrictions that you would be interested in in addition to the model. For instance, factor means held equal across two of the four groups. While estimating them freely, but then afterwards, uh, in a model test feature, test if they are equal. It's true, you could do a second run and do a likelihood ratio test, but here you get the results right away. So for instance, testing and quality of loadings. You have the model, factor measured by three indicators, and you give the uh, labels P1, P2, P3. Note that all of the uh, factor loadings are, are free here. We fix the factor variance instead to set the metric of the factor. And you can estimate that model while testing it, testing that P2 is equal to P1 and P3 equals P1, namely that the three loadings are equal. So you estimate it, allowing the loadings to be unequal, and then test that they are equal. That gives you an alternative to the likelihood ratio test, <coughs> which might be convenient in some settings. And here, finally, then, folks, you see the general structural equation model <coughs> explicated for a simultaneous uh, analysis of several groups lowercase g ranging from 1 up to g groups. You have the measurement model here. We talked about EFA in the beginning of the day in Formula 26. We, talk, we added direct effects from covariates to the y's to estimate these k or kappa parameters, direct effects, measurement, and non-invariance. And we talked about structural equation modeling with regressions among latent variables, where eta is regressed on other etas with regression coefficient matrix beta, and regressed also onto covariates x with the matrix gamma. There you have the full expression. For those of you who have been longing to see that, you finally have it. And there are the further readings on SEM. There are a couple of good books. Uh, Boland's book is good. Brown and Arminger, if you're technically inclined. 
The Artist School Bin Store Room has a collection of papers in uh, a book published by Apt Associates in Massachusetts. Here is uh, the Monte Carlo paper by Linda and I. And then uh, comes the references that you have for all of what we talked about today. So I think with that, we have plenty of time to take questions on this last segment. Or actually, on a full day. Go ahead. I wanted to ask, what's the difference between the syntax on, on 208, you have grouping is gender, um, and then a model, and then the syntax on 212, you have model male. And I wanted to know, what's it, like, what, how are those doing different things? Okay, so the question is the difference between the model commands on these two slides. Yeah. And so the difference is that in the, on the right screen, in the group specific model command for males, I'm mentioning the intercepts for reading science and math algebra. When I don't mention them, they're held equal across groups. So when I mention them, that relaxes the equality and it takes into account that they're not the same for males and females. So I'm allowing that to be modeled. I'm not sure if that answers it. Can I, in that connection, I, I remember that uh, person in the audience um, gave us a comment that on slide 205, I do believe we have uh, an omission here. Slide 205, <coughs> and you can see it on the right here, no? uh, Slide 205, we, we do a multiple group analysis without measurement invariance because we want to see the CFI and RMSA, the fit units of so the joint sample. <coughs> and we didn't want to have any invariance in the multiple group run. And we freed up the uh, factor loading like this. But given that the default now is mean structure. Then the intercepts are held equal. The intercepts are held equal, which we, we, we want to avoid here. So we should actually have included either set no mean structure or included um, the uh, so intercepts. That's 205. Because I think, I don't think we did that wrong, but I have to look at the one first. But we certainly could have. What, while you think about that, I'll take the next question. OK. Yes. Um, for slide uh, 226. 226. Two, no. My question is, um, there's another level to this body, and that powerlessness and anomia are also factors themselves. So there are questionnaire items. Could you say that part again? Powerlessness and anomia are factors themselves, meaning they're questionnaire items that were summed, one level up, that were summed or averaged to create the measure of powerlessness. Right. What are your comments with regard to that, with regard to your rule of four or five indicators? Okay, so I think the question is, uh, the anomia and powerlessness scores up here, the indicators, continuous variables, are themselves a sum of uh, sub-items, perhaps dichotomous items, I can't remember. Uh, what, does that help in, uh, in our modeling that we really have further components? Yes, uh, it, it could if you handle it right. And we'll talk about that tomorrow when we talk about categorical items. But in principle, it would have been better to work with the, if you only end up with two indicators, to work with the, um, the constituent uh, elements, that, items that go into each sum. Breaking it up into that, you will then have more information than you have here. And that would be better. Then you would enable yourself to pull out measurement error in a proper way. Okay, or let me go back to 205. What should have been on this slide is analysis. Model equals no mean structure. Right. So on slide 205, uh, above the model line on slide 205, you want to add analysis equal no mean structure. No, no, no. Model equals no mean structure. Uh, model equals no mean structure. Do you have a pen? The one over there broke. Could I use your pen? <laughs> Thank you. So that's a. <laughs> I just need this to write is this a, a reason change over to the um, mean structure being default that causes this 
here on that slide too. Far. So we thank you for that uh, comment. Okay. Yes. <coughs> so the question is, do we have an upper limit on the number of indicators? Um, I think uh, the upper limit is really uh, uh, not the statistical limit, but more a computational limit. So uh, if, if you would have uh, 100 indicators for each of these three constructs, you would have 300 indicators in a very <coughs> get a very cumbersome analysis, which would be very slow. So, uh, But isn't it the case that if you have like 20 indicators, that you could just pretty much add them up? Well, that's, that's a good point, too, which we'll cover tomorrow. If you have many indicators, you know, by the in psychometrics, you talk about the Spearman-Brown formula. If you have many indicators that you know measure one factor, you can just add them up and you would have a very reliable uh, representation of the factor. So in that case, if you have many indicators where you actually know, but you have to know this, that they, they measure one and the same factor, then you could just add them up and you wouldn't have the problem of having too many variables. Wouldn't that be a problem when you would want more than one dimension there for a factor? I mean, that's what I'm kind of struggling with because I have... No, because then you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have to have the factor then. Oh, then you could measure the indicators. Yes. You would just use the sum. So I guess the optimal uh, range for a number of indicators is between 4 and 20 <laughs> per factor. Yes, in the back. Um, for the formative indicators, uh, I'm assuming we can't run an EFA at the beginning and find out like they load on that particular factor. Could, it's you, like could you speak a little louder, please? Yeah, sorry. I, when we run an EFA, uh, we are assuming that they're effect indicators, right? That the, that the arrow goes from the F to the indicator. But yes, for EFA, you assume that you have a reflective situation where the arrow goes from F to the indicator. Yes. So can we use EFA to kind of figure out which variables um, indicators load on which factors and then use them as formative indicators? So I think the question is, can you use EFA <coughs> to figure out um, anything about formative indicators? <coughs> um, like which, which variables hang in together and then use those as um, formative indicators on, on, on a factor? Uh, I, can't, I can't see a, a, a direct way of doing that through EFA. I think you would have to modify EFA in some, some ingenious way to be able to. It certainly has an implication for the covariance structure. Um, but um, no, I couldn't say offhand okay. that EFA will be used. So you have to use it based on theory. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Theoretically, wouldn't running a PCA analysis help you determine the variables that would create a formative factor? Since a PCA would give you a principal component, and so the arrows would be going in that direction. So the question is, wouldn't wouldn't a Principal component analysis, PCA, for this uh, slide 226 SCFC indicators, help decide which uh, formative indicators might be useful. <coughs> yeah, I, I think that, that actually may be a good approach for uh, formative indicators because there you are trying to figure out uh, a, a linear composite of uh, indicators. Uh, the, uh, the eigenvalues would. Uh, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues will give you information about the, uh, the weights for the formative indicators and, and their importance. Uh, so uh, SCS will be the first principal component, for instance. So uh, I, yeah, I think you're right. I think that could be, but but it wouldn't tell. It wouldn't. Which? Yeah, I, I guess if you have se you, you have principal component analysis, you have several components. You can see which variables are important for one component but not for the other. Yeah, I think that's true. That's good. Yeah. Good point. Yes. I have a question about the syntax on page 216. 216. <laughs> So you're asking, so the question is about the equality labels one, two, and three? Okay. So whenever a parameter 
has the same equality label, those two parameters are held equal. So for example, let's say math had one in it also. Then the variances of reading and math would be held equal to each other and equal across groups. Now what it's saying is that the variance of reading has a one behind it in all groups. Because remember, the overall model command is the same for all groups. So the variance of reading is held equal across the groups. And likewise, because we have a quality label two, the variance of math is held equal across groups. So all parameters that share the same equality label are held equal during model estimation, and only one value will be found in the results for all those parameters. So they'll, they'll all have the same value. Yeah, but if you omit all these one, two, three, is, is the result that will be the same? No, because, okay, the, I hear what you're saying. Because you're forgetting that the, there is another one. There's a one in the male group, and there's a one in the female group. So the overall model command we have a group for male and group for female. That is copied for males and females. So think if we had model male and we had this, and then model female and we had this. M plus does that for you. So then you'd have a one for males and a one for females, and that would be the equality constraint. Is that what's confusing you? Because you're only seeing one, one, one in this? Well, I guess what I'm trying to see is, for the parameter estimates in the reading by and math by part, it didn't specify one, two, three, four, and those are, you know, those parameters are held constrained. That's um, because okay. they're constrained to be equal as the default. We do that automatically in M plus as the default. We don't hold the only parameters that are held equal as the default in M plus are the factor loadings and the intercepts. The measurement parameters. The measurement parameters. Not if you the structural parameters. want any other structural parameter to be held equal, you have to do it explicitly. So the idea is that what, what we believe is closest to the truth is that the measurement parameters are invariant, and whereas the structural parameters are not. You have to specify that. So if you want that further invariance of the structural parameters, you have to specify like that. Yes. yes. The slide 247, F3 is a mediator between F1, F2 on the one hand and F4 on the other hand. That, that's, that's what's going on. Yeah. Yes, you can think about this in terms of mediation. Absolutely. The, the indirect effect of F1 on F4 is the product of F3 on F1 times F4 on F3. So, so it, the uh, indirect mediational thinking carries over directly to latent variables. Is that what you're asking? I'm asking. Um, Conceptually, what would I be looking at to see if it is a mediator? Oh, okay. What would you look at conceptually uh, to see that F3 is a mediator between F1 and F4? Correct. Well, you would want uh, a couple of different things. You would want a significant uh, indirect effect. The product of these two should, have signif should be significant. And uh, you want to know to which extent F1 has a direct effect of F4. If it's totally absent, then it's F3 is perfectly mediating the effect from F1 to F4. Uh, if, it's, if you have a little bit of a direct effect, then only part of it is medi mediated. Mm -hmm. So uh, mediation is usually a, a rescue vehicle when you say that F4 regressed on F1. If you didn't have F3, F4 regressed on F1 would be insignificant. <coughs> you can still save the day by pulling out an intervening variable where the indirect effect is significant because you're looking at sort of shorter distances here in uh, Is there something equivalent to like a Sobel test where you say this change 
Yes. This, yeah, exactly. The Sobel test, uh, the model is part of model indirect, which uh, is applicable to latent variables just as it is for observed variables. I actually use the Sobel test on that by doing clear. Yeah. Sobel test is the uh, delta method in the model indirect. Of or you could just use model indirect in M plus, and we would automatically give you the standard error for that. Yeah. So we only looked at model indirect for observed variables this morning, but it can also be used for latent variables. Yes, You're welcome. In the back. Can you just tell us which chapter do you discuss the interaction between latent variables in? <coughs> which chapter do we discuss the interaction between latent variables? Uh, that would uh, be in chapter 16. You need the X with option? Uh, if you want to look at the option, it's chapter 16. Or you could just look at the... Um, the, uh, or, uh, but also, examples of this are in the chapter uh, 5, right? I think we have an example in chapter 5, and the option is discussed in chapter 16, and the reference is given. I think only one reference is given to that, but that's the extent of the discussion. By the way, you should know that every example that's in the user's guide has its Monte Carlo counterpart. So the, the data were generated through Monte Carlo simulation. So on your CD, uh, or plus CD, or on, your, um, on our website, you can get hold of uh, the data and the model mo Monte Carlo uh, creation of that data as well. OK, you, question, we have a question over here. So, um, on slide 35 and 36, you talked about model interaction. I'm sorry, which slide? 35 and 36. Oh, OK. You talked about uh, model interaction and speech interaction. Not for parameter estimates. The, the only thing that bootstrap is used for is standard errors. We don't bootstrap parameter estimates. I, I think the question is, do we bootstrap parameter estimates? And the answer is no. At this point in time, we're only bootstrap standard errors. Okay, yes. Um, I had a question about the syntax um, 216 and the syntax on 227. Um, for the modification in the speaker, there's a number in the bracket. Two, did you say two, 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 six, 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 two, Values in the brackets. No, in the after the modification, it would be 3.84. Oh, I see. And the other one, it's a zero. What's the, what's the difference? Okay. In NM plus, the default, when you ask for modification indices in the output command, we only print modification indices that are larger than 3.84, the chi square value that would be a significant drop at one degree of freedom. But if you want to, you can put zero or any number you want. And then we'll only print the modification indices larger than the value that's in parentheses. So putting zero here, you essentially get every modification in there. Okay, the question is about. Uh, specifically. The question is about Monte Carlo simulations, and um, the question is, I think, where, where do you get the parameter values from? Well, yes. Oh, okay. So the question is, are we simulated from any specified distribution? And uh, <coughs> yes. All of these simulations are based on the normal distribution in here, so the normal distribution. If you want to uh, orchestrate non-normality, our 2002 paper uh, discusses how to do that. You can, for instance, use uh, mixture modeling, so working with two classes, two normal, two classes <coughs> um, where you mix together two normals can create a very skewed distribution, for instance. You have that possibility of studying non-normality that way, too, and see how non-normality robust these non-normality procedures actually are. OK, any other questions? OK, one more. OK. In the very beginning, you talked about your basic model uh, for 
slide 45, and that even though you did not specify an M plus code, you it could co-vary, like X1 and X2 could co-vary, and you did not have to specify that in the model. And yet, later on, when you use that model of um, enemy, enemia and power, you <coughs> specify um, that an indicator from each of those factors was correlated. So why the difference? Why did you say, you know, power 67 is correlated with power 71? So with the question about the covariance of X's in the Monte Carlo? No. Not in Monte Carlo. In two different models. So the question has to do with the contrast between slides 46 oh. to uh, 26 and 226. I correlate the residuals, whereas in slide 46, I said uh, you couldn't do it. Is that approximately the question? Or you said it, it doesn't matter if you do it or not. It, you have to um, do sample statistics in order to get a correlation between those two items. But in the second model, you ask for that correlation. But this model, there's a difference between the two models in that those are covariates, they're exogenous variables. These are endogenous variables, so the residual covariances. So what we were talking about when, with covariates in the model, exogenous observed covariates, we don't estimate their means, variances, and covariances as part of the model. Well, here, they're, they're dependent they, variables here. Oh, they're dependent Both variables exogenous. there, too. Okay. Let, let me try to answer the question the way I see it. So you, you, here in this model, you cannot identify this correlation between the residuals. In that model, you can. So in that model, it's possible to say, uh, to use the width statement for the residual correlations. Uh, here it isn't because you can't identify that. That would be one parameter too many. And in, in any case, um, what you what you see here that there's not an error correlation for items on the same factor, but an item correlation for items across factors. Uh, so um, it, it's a little bit of a different situation there. But all, also in this case on the left on slide 226, is there a danger of having two indicators only? for the reason that we um, really can't do this measurement model part for alienation separately, but I have to rely on other parts of the model that may be misspecified as well. Does that come close to answering your question? <laughs> Good. <laughs> and we have one final question over here, I think. No? So you had a question about the Monte Carlo simulation, and the simulation is from the normal distribution. And what was your follow-up? <laughs> no, the uh, the mean and the variance of the distributions are defined through the model. So uh, it's not the standard normal, but it depends on the model specification. And I think that's described in chapter 11. Okay. So thank so you thank all. Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow.